A retired college professor was just wanting to live out the rest of his life in peace, but his life would be ended in a greedy murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Robert Sharp. Viewer discretion is advised. Robert Sharp was born on May 15, 1941, and at the time this case occurred, he is living peacefully in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Robert had begun working at the University of Michigan all the way back in 1969, where he was described as a professor who would who was constantly mentoring all of the incoming students. He was an extremely informative, well-educated, and just all-around great professor. He was a professor in the Department of Chemistry there at the University of Michigan. He was considered a man with a mind full of science, but he also had a very deep love of history, of art, of philosophy. He loved world affairs. He loved traveling. He retired from his professor work back in 2008, and his plan was just to live a relaxing, peaceful rest of his life in his home in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he planned to do so with the love of his life, his wife, Maria. They also had a son named David, who was a full-grown adult at this time. But in April of 2018, unfortunately, Maria passed away. And so Robert was deeply affected by this, obviously. He lost the love of his life. He and his wife, Maria, would always go to the local Wendy's restaurants there. They went there several times a week, either for lunch or for dinner. They were basically regulars there, and the staff there recognized them. They knew them, and this will come back in a little bit. But they, they would go there all the time. It was June 10th, 2018. A very good friend of Robert Sharp had she had not heard from him and she hadn't seen him and so she was just curious as to what was going on and so she got into her car and she drove to Robert's home when she pulled up to his house he no she noticed that his front door was left open and there was like a couple of newspapers or something like that on the stoop of his home this was very strange because why is his door open he hasn't collected his newspapers she felt something was off. So she calls 911 and asks them to please do a welfare check on her friend. And they oblige, they go there. Since the door is already open, they, when police arrive, they have a very strong uh, smell of smoke or like a fire had been lit somewhere in the house. And that immediately gave them cause to enter the home. They kind of navigated the house and they found where the fire was. It was actually down in the basement. So before they did anything else, they got fire and rescue there. The firemen had to break the window of the basement where when they when they were breaking that window, they would say, we see a hand. They saw someone's hand on the ground. So they enter the basement and they end up putting the fire out. And when they do, when the smoke kind of settles, there is a body in the basement. The body is pretty badly burned and they're able to identify the body based on some identification cards and whatnot next to them. The identity of the individual in the basement was that of 77-year-old Robert Sharp. It was an incredibly gruesome scene. It was violent because Robert, they said, had literally been cut in half. Robert was stabbed, they determined, about 30 times. 17 of those cuts were actually slashes and the rest were actual physical stabs. His body was covered up with old newspapers and like uh, blankets and stuff like that. They assume because it would have been easy to light those on fire and the killer was trying to hide the evidence, obviously. So now police are back in the house searching the home and there's blood all over the place. They can tell that this attack of Robert started in the kitchen. There was blood kind of spatter all over it. And then there was drag marks in blood leading to the basement. So that's when they can determine he was the, the attack started in the kitchen and then he was brought down to the basement where he was eventually killed. 
They found a note in one of Robert's trash cans and it just said, see you tonight. And it appeared to have come from a neighbor. They questioned that neighbor, like, you know, was this a cryptic note or something, you know? They had to kind of just, they had to investigate all possible angles here. Uh, they determined that that note literally was just that the neighbor had borrowed Robert's wheelbarrow and the see you tonight was, I'll be bringing you back. So that note wasn't, didn't lead to anything. They're searching the home for any other evidence, like any kind of bloody items, the, the murder weapon, anything like that, but they don't really find much else. They questioned the person who called 911 initially because you kind of have to, because a lot of times when the 911 caller either has found a body or they're calling for a welfare check, sometimes it is the killer because they want to make sure the body is found, but they also want to inject themselves kind of into the investigation. So they had to investigate her, but they determined she had absolutely nothing to do with this. A few days before Robert's murder on June 6th, the, he had actually himself called 911 to report that his home had been burglarized. He said it was obvious that a few of his like drawers and cabinets had been opened and rummaged through, and there were some kind of high value items missing. He said he was missing a couple of like a laptop and then a couple of these uh, Roku devices that he had, they were also missing. They found out through talking to Robert's friends and acquaintances uh, about the fact that he and his wife had gone to that local Wendy's literally all the time. And because police really didn't have a whole bunch of evidence or tips to work with, to find out who did this, they decided, you know what, let's go to the Wendy's. Maybe someone there knows Robert and maybe knows what items he has. It's a long shot, but let's try it. So they go there, they question every employee, and then they do background checks also on every employee. And they find one individual named Isom Hamilton, who had been working there at the Wendy's. He, lo and behold, was on parole for a burglary charge. He had been convicted of home invasion, and so he was now on parole for that. He was really the only employee there that had any kind of criminal history. He had a lengthy criminal history uh, that involved like breaking and entering and other like charges and misdemeanors and stuff like that. So I just wanted to bring him in for questioning just to see if he knew anything about this. They said that when they talked to Isom in the interrogation room, he was just like dead in the face, just very like rock solid, stone cold. He just seemed completely unmoved by anything. They asked him if they, you know, if he knew Robert, he acknowledged that he knew who he was because he was always at the Wendy's. And they asked him, do you have you, did you hear any of your fellow coworkers talk talking about maybe robbing Robert's home or anything like that. He said, no, uh, there was really nothing bad you could say about Robert at all. He seemed like a good guy. And they just flat out asked the guy, did you break into his home and did you kill him? He said, no. They had asked him like, where had you been the night of the murder? And he kind of gave them some places he had gone to. And so they found some uh, CCTV footage at a convenience store that Isom Hamilton had gone to. In that surveillance footage, they find him and he's wearing a gray shirt with jeans and they could tell that in his jeans had some stains on it. They couldn't really tell what it was in the video, but you could just, they could tell there were stains. It could have been blood. He also had on two different backpacks. They said at one point in this video, he, Isom could be seen opening the backpack and you can see in the backpack, even with the camera, and it looks like there were some electronic devices in there but they couldn't tell exactly what they were from this footage. They discovered that Isom had been living with his grandma. He had been there for a while. And so they go and talk to her and she's relatively forthcoming with police. Uh, she says, yeah, he has been staying with me. And she even said, I have been noticing some odd behavior from him. He has things in his possession that I didn't think he could afford or I know he can't afford. Like he had an Apple computer. And she said when she asked him about it, he said that, yeah, I bought it from a friend for cheap. They asked her like, do you know about any other laptops? Do you know anything about any kind of Roku devices? And she said, well, he has like multiple boxes full of things, electronics and stuff like that um, at the house. They also asked her, do you remember him coming home with anything unusual on his clothes? And she said, yeah, well, not too long ago, he came home one night and he had blood on his jeans. And I, you know, she goes, I asked him, 
is that your blood? And he said, no, it's not my blood. It was someone else's blood. He said, because me and some other person, we got into a fight and that's why there's blood. This gave them plenty of uh, probable cause to get a warrant to search the grandmother's home. When they get there, they find the exact clothing that he had been wearing that night. They discovered that on the night of the murder, by looking into Robert's transactions, there was an attempt to transfer money from Robert's bank account into Isom's bank account that failed. It didn't work. This occurred at around 12.30 a.m. the night that Robert would have been killed. And that's proof alone that during when the murder was happening, there is a direct connection from trying to take money from Robert's account and putting it directly into Isom's. That's pretty damning evidence right there. They also pulled up the cell phone data from his cell phone, from Isom's cell phone. His phone was pinging off of a tower that was the same tower for Robert's home and it had been pinging there for roughly two, two and a half hours or so. Also, in the exact time frame, the murder would have happened and when that transfer from the bank account was trying to take place. On June 27, 2018, they had enough evidence now to get an arrest warrant issued. They followed Isom Hamilton to a park where they arrested him and on his possession he had the same backpack he was wearing in the surveillance footage. When they open up that, that backpack, they find the stolen laptop from Robert's home and the Roku devices were also in his possession. The same Rokus that had been stolen prior to Robert's murder. And so that was, again, another, another thing. We, we got you. So he was charged with first degree murder. He was also charged with arson because he set the body on fire, which also burned part of the house. Uh, he was also charged with in home invasion and the mutilation of a dead body. Why did he do this? He didn't care about Robert's life. He just wanted things to steal so that he could sell them. He was greedy. He All he cared about was getting items and selling them for a profit. That's it. The life of Robert Sharp meant absolutely nothing to him. It, his life was worthless. That was it. Just, I got to kill this guy because I need his money. They had never really met really formally. You know, they probably had met each other. And they, they do believe that it was because he had seen Robert and his wife at the Wendy's all the time. And maybe he saw what kind of money they had or some of the items maybe they were wearing, like expensive things. And so that's what led them to go to his home, Isom to go to Robert's home. The evidence against him was, I mean, there was, it was insurmountable. They, I will tell you this, they did not have like fingerprints at all at the house. They didn't have like, hit, Isom's DNA was not found anywhere in the home or anything like that. So they couldn't they didn't have anything to place Isom directly in the home through physical evidence like that, but they did have the stolen items confirmed from Robert's home. They also had the fact that he did have Robert's blood on his jeans. And they also, I mean, they just, they had the transfer of the money, the attempted transfer of money. It was, it was clear. It was clear. He tried to deny it saying he had nothing to do with it. They got the wrong guy, but it, it was just, it was overwhelming against him. So, Isom Hamilton would be found guilty by the jury and convicted, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The judge would look him dead in the eye and say that Isom Hamilton, you are a vile and dangerous human being. You are a danger to society, and you should never be able to walk freely again. Isom looked at the judge with no emotion, didn't say anything, no response. He just didn't seem to care. But in the end, he is now locked away in a jail cell, and he'll never be able to hurt anyone ever again. Robert Sharp was just this elderly guy who was this beloved professor a wonderful husband, an amazing father, and everybody in his life just misses him so dearly. What was all, what, for why did he have to die? Because one man needed money, wanted money. And instead of earning it his own way, he just stole things from people to sell. And he murdered an innocent man for ultimately what? Probably uh, maybe if he sold all those things, if you had the chance to, what, a couple hundred bucks? 
That's what Robert's life was worth to him. Just a few hundred bucks, maybe. But in the end, Robert Sharp and his family, thankfully, got the justice they rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, true crime. Aruni Dooney Dingleberry Dongs, I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe to this channel if you like true crime. I tell stories basically every day. Follow me over on my two TikTok pages. Those are both linked below in the link tree in the description of this video. The links to my TikToks also pop up here at some point in the beginning and at the end of the video. Feel free to check those out. I tell short form true crime stories over there. Also in the link tree below, you will find my merch store. We have like t-shirts and hoodies. We ship all over the entire world. So if you like to see that, go ahead and check it out. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a super duper quick email. Just gotta tell me the name of the individual or the case, where it happened, when it happened. I'll add it to the list. The list has over 6,200 names on it. I pick the cases I cover each time at random. I cannot tell you when I'll cover that case you recommend, but I will get to it eventually, yeah. But that is it for this case, True Crime Aroonies. So, yeah. I'm drinking from a pride mug. Um, and I'm showing this just to make some of you really mad because I know there's some of you out there who see this stuff and makes them really mad to see pride stuff. What the old pride flag, I've gotten comments on that before. Here's a pride mug, drinking from it. Tasting the rainbow, baby. What are you doing? Happy pride! <laughs>